I'm Claudia Bester. I'm the Director of Public Programs and Education here at the Hammer Museum. It's my great pleasure to introduce tonight's talk about restoring the system of checks and balances to the rule of law. Um, the Hammer Forum is a series of, of public discussions about current social and political issues, and it's made possible with the very generous support of Andy and Bronya Galef. Bravo. Thank you so much. Um, tonight's distinguished guests are legal scholars Bruce Fine and Philippe Sands, and our moderator is Ian Masters. Ian is a BBC-trained broadcast journalist who's covered national security affairs for over 25 years on public radio. Um, he is the host of Background Briefing, which can be heard on KPFK on Sundays from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Ian's been a senior fellow at UCLA's Center for Strategic and International Affairs and the UCLA Center for International Relations, and he was a consultant at the Center for National Security Studies at Los Alamos in New Mexico. So please join me in welcoming Ian Masters. Thank you, Claudia, and thank you all for coming. While many are questioning President Obama's leadership in apparently yielding to the power of the banksters who ruined the economy only to be rewarded by the taxpayer, it does seem ironic that after eight years of unbridled executive hubris, anyone would want a more aggressive presidency. Bush and Cheney not only asserted a unitary executive with absolute wartime powers, conveniently derived from a war they contrived, but like Roman emperors, they exercised power in an unusually personal and capricious way. Historians are already relegating them as the worst leaders in our history, an insecure decider operating, operating from the gut, guided by a cynical insider out to settle all scores, manipulating the levers of power from a dark star inside a secret parallel universe where his cabal had access to everything but shared nothing, all the while operating in a constitutional netherworld somewhere between the executive and the legislative branches. How did they accrue and exercise such power? Yet it was not just the lethal combination of ignorance and arrogance that led us into two losing wars and to the brink of financial ruin. It was a complicitous and gutless press an effectless and cowardly political opposition that enabled this usurpation. And not only did we allow them to choose wars at whim, you're with us or against us, they were able to, to change the definition of war itself to suit their likes and dislikes, good against evil, war anywhere, anytime, at any cost. And although they wanted to attack Iraq, they reluctantly went into Afghanistan against the perpetrators of 9-11. But then they got to have the war they wanted all along, Operation Iraqi Freedom. But it was Bush and Cheney's insistence on proving the lie they sold the Iraq war, pro proving, uh, proving the lie they sold the Iraq war on that became their undoing. For the first two years of the Iraq war, Bush s sent most of our soldiers and all of our intelligence assets on a wild goose chase looking for Saddam's WMDs and links to Al Qaeda. So every door they kicked in and every family they terrorized and every male they humiliated and threw into Abu Ghraib became the seeds of an insurgency Bush was unwittingly recruiting. Meanwhile, the word insurgency was stricken from all briefings until reality overcame faith-based intelligence as Iraq was blowing up in their faces. Yet even then, for another three years and thousands of casualties later, they denied reality until General Petraeus and David Kilcullen came along to rescue them from themselves. But slowly, as mission accomplished turned sour, it was the torture that really turned the tables, not only in recruiting the insurgents, but in alienating America from the decent opinion of mankind. Was it the misplaced vengeance of armchair strategists or the sadism of a, fra of a frustrated frat rat? How did lawyers authorize breaking the law? Were they just following orders? What were they thinking? Were they thinking? 
and for what. From the mire of recent history, where extraordinary rendition and vengeance overcame justice and a fair trial, it takes Shakespeare's Portia to remind us the quality of mercy is not strained. It is twice blessed. It blesseth him that gives and him that takes. If mercy is a blessing, then torture is a curse. And it is twice cursed. It curseth him that gives and him that takes. It gives humanity and sympathy to the tortured, even if he is a mass murderer responsible for 9-11, and since it is done in our name, it takes away from all of us our humanity. Bruce Fine will speak for about 15 minutes, followed by Philippe Sands. Then we will have a brief discussion before opening up to Q&A from you, the audience. Bruce Fine is a constitutional lawyer who formerly served as Associate Deputy Attorney General in the Reagan administration, General Counsel of the Federal Communications Commission, Research Director for the Joint Congressional Committee on Covert Arms Sales to Iran, and member of the American Bar Association's Task Force on Presidential Signing Statements. He has authored several volumes on the United States Supreme Court, the United States Constitution, and international law, and helped write the articles of impeachment for President Nixon and President Clinton. Bruce Fine is the author of a new book, Constitutional Peril, the life and death struggle of our constitution and democracy. Ladies and gentlemen, Bruce Fine. Whenever you receive such effusions, you remind yourself they're not said under oath. <laughs> now, I also feel that I'm succeeding Shakespeare <clears throat> And so I have a, a high standard to satisfy. But I think I can be most helpful here in providing some amplification, even if perhaps a little dissonance from what Ian has said. Because I think uh, what we've witnessed over the last decades is not simply a lack of leadership, a disdain for the Constitution and our philosophy of government amongst the leaders, uh, but ultimately, it's the failure of ourselves. We, the people, are sovereign under the Constitution. And we knew what was going on. Uh, Bush and Cheney, in many respects, boasted of the torture, the illegal surveillance. And when they didn't, we often had leaks to the press. And yet there was very little public response. I know John Dean's in the audience. I was there at Watergate. The difference of the Saturday night massacre and uh, the public outrage that basically forced the Watergate committee hearings and ultimately the impeachment proceedings in the House. Uh, they came about not because we had benevolent members of Congress, but because the public was outraged. And you remember that statement of President Nixon to Mr. Frost, if the president does it, does it it's legal to justify the burglary of Ellsberg's psychiatrist's office. And that left him uh, open to charges of uh, imperial presidency and forced him ultimately from the White House. Now let's fast forward to today, just a few days ago, Condoleezza Rice. If the president says it, it's not torture, it complies with the torture convention. And that seems to be at least a tacit uh, conclusion by the non-investigation of Bush and Cheney and others by the incumbent administration. Uh, and what, to me, is most frightening about uh, the disdain and the trampling of the Constitution by Bush and Cheney, uh, where you could understand, given their megalomania and partisanship, uh, what was driving them, is that with the new administration, with the support of the American people, with an overwhelming Democratic Congress, and with an obligation enshrined in Article 2, Section 3 of the Constitution to see that the laws be faithfully executed. We see nothing. The highest levels. Now, maybe there may be an investigation of the lawyers who wrote these shoddy memoranda, but we didn't have Hitler's lawyers at Nuremberg. Because where is the clearest evidence? The president and the vice president, the former president and vice president, have said, we authorized waterboarding. The current incumbent says waterboarding is torture. It's a crime. 
The Attorney General says waterboarding is torture. And you'll notice the Torture Convention, our federal statute, makes no exceptions. It doesn't say you can torture to get good evidence. It doesn't say you can torture because it would be politically attractive. It says no torture, period. No semicolons, question marks, exclamation points, period. Because the prohibition against torture, more than what it speaks about the way in which you conduct warfare, is an earmark of who we are as a people. We don't torture because we're the United States of America and we're civilized. Even if it gave us useful information, which is problematic, we don't do it. And that's what's in the law. And if you don't like the law, you don't just decree that it's changed. No one's king. No one can say, well, there ought to be exceptions on their own. You have to go and amend it, have a debate about it. And to me, it's just astonishing that we'd be me arguing whether we got good intelligence from torture as though that's relevant to flouting the law. It may be relevant if the president wanted to issue a pardon, which requires the recipient to accept and acknowledge guilt. But it is monstrous to have an open acknowledgment by highest officials of the land of, the land of serious crimes, non-enforcement, no pardons, getting away with impunity, and the signal being sent in the name of national security, the president can do anything. When Nixon said that, we threw him out of office. Now that seems to be a theme that doesn't resonate anymore. The principle, I guarantee you, will lie around like a loaded weapon, ready to be used by any president who claims he needs to do something dramatic, optical purposes or otherwise. It will lie around like a loaded weapon. And in my mind, I am just totally nonplussed as to why this is happening. We have a president graduated from Harvard Law School who is on the Harvard Law Review. He teaches constitutional law at University of Chicago. He knows what his obligations are. I assume he knows what happened in Watergate, what the principles are. And it's very simple. I'll go through it again. Article 2, Section 3 says, the president must take care that the laws be faithfully executed. Its etymology came from Great Britain in the English Bill of Rights of 1688. Some of the kings refused to enforce laws against recusancy or other provisions they didn't like. They called the dispensing power. That outraged the British, and the English Bill of Rights said, no king can decline to enforce the laws without the authority of the parliament. We inherited that idea in Article 2, Section 3. So we know what its meaning is. You're not king. Then we have also the clear evidence that a crime occurred, and there are no exceptions to torture. And then we have no enforcement. The president has said, well, I do not want to be anything but forward-looking. If you're only forward-looking, that is the death knell of the criminal law, because it's only backward-looking. We don't punish things that haven't happened. Right. And if we were only forward-looking, I guess we'd forget about 9-11, why we have troops over looking at Osama bin Laden in caves in Afghanistan if we're just forward-looking. So it's a sophomoric observation and is not an honorable way to debate a serious issue. And then the president, well, he doesn't want to do things that could upset his domestic agenda. Well, say, there is nothing in our prohibitions that say, you don't need to enforce the law if it's needed to help your domestic agenda. If you want to put that exception in the law, we have a mechanism of doing it. You go to Congress, and the American people say, we need to have a change. Because process. Process is what defines the country as a republic. How you make decisions, how you hold people accountable, that is what distinguishes a republic from an empire, a democracy from a tyranny. And that is what we've lost sight of. Let's take an examination as well of how we got into this issue of torture and why we didn't know this was going on. The whole idea in the Declaration of Independence of government by the consent of the governed that the government is there to secure the, li the rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That's the purpose of government. Requires transparency. How can you give consent to government if you don't know what it's doing? You can't. And even if transparency helps in some minor way our adversaries, the strength it gives to us as a people, knowing that we chart our own destiny, we know what's going on, we decide whether to approve it or disapprove it, vastly outweighs any loss of encouraging 
Osama or the Al-Qaeda to harden themselves against future torture so they wouldn't yield information. And we didn't know these enhanced interrogation acts. We had a right to decide whether we wanted to be associated with that because they're using our tax money. They're acting on our behalf when they commit those crimes. And we had a right to know instantly, do we approve or disapprove, to lobby Congress to change the law, to have impeachment or otherwise. It was all secret. And it was secret not just because of Bush and Cheney. It was secret because people like Nancy Pelosi, Jane Harmon, Democrats, they were told and kept it secret. Some of them, like the speaker said, well, I'm a vassal and they told me I couldn't tell anyone. No. Then why are you the speaker of the house? You should leave. No. It's just really quite disgusting. So there is a tendency to try to cast aspersion and blame for the plight of our democracy and the Constitution on personalities. But ultimately, it isn't just Bush and Cheney. It's much broader. And it's a, if I call a political decadence, no longer understanding what our civic obligations are in duty, no longer the thrill that we should get of governing our own destiny, of making sure that we accept responsibility for the government we have. We must be active and aggressive and knowledgeable and make our voice heard. And that thrill, that dignity of being involved in self-government is what gives us the drive and the persistence to call to account those wayward politicians. Ultimately, if we lose that in our culture, in our society, I can guarantee you the Constitution will not proceed on cruise control. It will fall and everyone in power will grab what they've got. That's we're dangerously close to that. Even with the torture memos that were released, why is it, ladies and gentlemen, the ACLU had to file a lawsuit against and continue it against the Obama administration to get these memos? Why weren't they voluntarily released? If you look at them, there's nothing exceptionally voyeuristic about them. Why were they even held as classified in the first instance? Secrecy is the bane of our self-government. With all the advantages people think it could give to the enemy, it's so destructive of our own ability to thrive as a democracy. It isn't worth it. It is not worth it. And if you think in the history of leaks, where are the great leaks that caused the United States great harm? Pentagon Papers? Nothing. I suppose the worst one was Dick Cheney himself, Valerie Plame and Joseph Wilson. You know, he knows how to leak information out. The members do if they want to advantage themselves. I'd like to just conclude by suggesting all of you here tonight are the future of the United States of America. History is biography. We have to take control of our government again. We have to insist candidates for office say they will accept responsibility. I don't want a member of Congress to delegate to the president the decision to go to war. I want a member to say, no, I'm going to make that decision. I'm not going to let the president keep things secret. I will be responsive to you. If not, they shouldn't be there. If we are unable to return to the philosophy of the founding generation of self-government, of checks and balances, of being concerned that our influence abroad should be by dint of our example, not by AK-47s, by drones or otherwise, then I'm fearful we will suffer the same fate as the Roman Empire, the British Empire, all other previous empires. And it's us to up, it's us up to us to prevent that fate. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Philip Sands is an international lawyer and a professor of law at University College London. <clears throat> he has been involved in many leading international cases, including those involving the treatment of British detainees at Guantanamo Bay. He is the author of the acclaimed book, Lawless World, and his new book, just out in paperback, is The Torture Team, Rumsfeld's Memo and the Betrayal of American Values. Ladies and gentlemen, Philip Sands. <clears throat>
very much to, to Ian and to everyone uh, involved at Hammer for putting this uh, conversation together. I must say, when I was first invited, I was told that I would have a distinguished opponent on the right with whom I would have to debate many of these issues. And uh, Bruce, who I've met tonight for the first time and am delighted to meet, is not quite of the right that I've had to engage with um, over the past uh, five years. Um, the sort of right that I've had to engage with um, was graphically illustrated to me on a Saturday afternoon uh, at the Emirates Football Stadium uh, in North London. I'm a big fan of a football club called Arsenal. And I was sitting there enjoying a game, and all the game started about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And at, at about 3.20, all of a sudden, my mobile phone started getting text messages and emails were coming in and have you seen the Washington Post? Have you seen what is going on? This was the autumn of 2006. And I couldn't, my machine gummed up, I watched the match, I went home, I didn't know what was going on, I had no idea where the phone was going. I just All I wanted to do was watch a football match. I get home, I go onto the internet, I check my emails and I check the Washington Post and what has happened is that there's been a meeting at the Federalist Society uh, in Washington DC and I have been personally attacked by the vice president and by his sidekick, Mr. Chertoff, as being the kind of person who poses a fundamental threat to the security and well-being of the United States. <laughs> um, what is it about me, a sort of establishment type of person from London, a barrister, a Queen's Council, a teacher at University College London, that could have so caused them to actually put pen to paper and out me as a threat to the well-being of this country. And it was the book that was mentioned by Ian, the first book that I wrote for a more general audience, Lawless World, which had as its thesis uh, that the United States and Britain, uh, countries which had done more than any other to put in place the idea of a global rule of law ethic, had, since September the 11th, greatly undermined the very notion of an international rule of law, a set of values and principles which I think defines us uh, and defines these two countries, particularly in the period since the Second World War, when they came together to put in place the very system of norms and values that we, I, have grown immensely attached to. After I published L Lawless World, I was encouraged to home in on one particular topic, and it was the topic that Ian uh, mentioned, and that is the subject of torture. And I don't come at it from the perspective uh, of Bruce. I'm not a US constitutional lawyer. I'm an international lawyer. I come at it uh, from the perspective of someone who has a great interest in the international conventions, which the United States has done so much to put in place. And I decided that what I would do in the second book is focus on a set of developments that I really had difficulty comprehending. Some of you will remember, and this was the turning point, I think, the true turning point, the moment of change, the publication of the first photographs of the abuses at Abu Ghraib on the CBS television program 60 Minutes in April 2004. That caused tremendous difficulty for the administration, which was faced with the challenge of presenting a narrative which said essentially, look, those photos are not us. Those photos are the results of a few bad eggs down at Guantanamo. And that narrative eventually culminated a couple of months later in an appearance by two of the most senior lawyers uh, of President Bush's administration, Jim Haynes, the general counsel to Mr. Rumsfeld at the Department of Defense, and Alberto Gonzalez at the time White House counsel, uh, in the old executive office building, the Eisenhower building, uh, on the 22nd of June 2004, and they released the first set of documents with which we have now become all too familiar. They released the full text for the first time of President Bush's decision to not apply the Geneva Conventions to anyone involved in the war against the United States, the terror war against the United States. They published the famous memo by Donald Rumsfeld signed on the 2nd of December 2002, the famous one where he writes, well, why standing limited to four hours? I stand for eight to ten hours a day. And they published a series of memoranda 
that had emanated apparently on their account from Guantanamo, which seemed to show on their account that the abuse, uh, the uh, abuse at uh, Abu Ghraib had nothing to do with the care, the deliberation, the loyaliness with which the administration actually went about getting more intelligence out of detainees at Guantanamo and other places. And I thought what I'd do was actually spend a little bit of my time trying to discover what had actually happened. And I didn't want to do it by reference to documents. I thought I would actually track down the individuals who had been involved in the decision-making process. From the lawyer down at Guantanamo, who was entirely anonymous by the name of Diane Beaver, right up to, <laughs> right up to Jim Haynes. Well, now everyone knows Diane Beaver, but of course, back then, no one did know who Diane Beaver was, right up to um, the more senior individuals, colorful characters like Douglas Fyth and Jim Haynes uh, in the Pentagon. And I spoke to a very, very large number of people. What troubled me, what caused me to do this, and I would do it sort of on the side from my day job, I'd have an arbitration hearing in Washington, then I'd go and spend a couple of days meeting with Jim Haynes or General Myers or whatever, and it is a true mark of the enormity of this country that someone like me, I had no contacts with these people, can just email them, telephone them, write to them, and they'll actually give me the time of day. That wouldn't happen in Britain, and I think a lot of credit is deserved for a lot of people for actually opening the door and letting me in. Often what would happen, in fact, is they would Google me the day before I arrived and realize that I wasn't quite what I seemed. I wasn't, as one person put it, the lawyer to the queen. They hadn't quite <laughs> understood what queen's council meant. There are actually a thousand queen's councils. And they found that I'd written books like Lawless World and, gosh, maybe we don't actually want to see this person. But in fact, everyone in the end I managed to speak with. And what emerged was what is now pretty much the popular narrative. We know what happened. It didn't start from the top. It, start, it didn't start at the bottom. It started at the top. There was a predetermined decision to move to abuse as early as December 2001. What can't be said very easily is we know that the policy was essentially determined by predisposition of the view that the only language these people understand is the language of violence and we have to show that we are strong. N no one who was subjected to any techniques of interrogation, and this is a difficult thing for any society to come to terms with, was white or Christian or Jewish. Every person who was abused was Muslim. It's as simple as that, and we have to deal with that reality. It happened, secondly, not just from the top, it happened on the basis of legal advices. The memos were absolutely central, but for the lawyers, this would not have happened. And that is the reason that I focused on the lawyers. I accept entirely that responsibility goes higher up. It goes higher up to the president, to the vice president, and to the secretary of defense. But if there had been lawyers in those key positions, this would never have happened. If there had been lawyers who carried out their task independently and fearlessly and said, back in 2002, I'm terribly sorry, there are limits in US law, there are limits in international law, this would not have happened. And so the key question that has emerged for me is what happened in the United States, country which I know is deeply committed to the rule of law, to allow a small group of politically appointed individuals to essentially hijack the legal decision-making process. And they are a very small group. They don't have, actually, a great deal of support. They are ideologically associated by membership of the Federalist Society that I had mentioned earlier. They are ideologically motivated by a predisposition against any norms or rules that might emerge from outside of the United States. They see international norms as a fundamental threat to the well-being of the United States, a direct reversal of the position that motivated the United States in the 1940s uh, and the 1950s. And they abdicated their function and their role as lawyers. We've become too familiar with these memos. I thought I'd become pretty hardened 
to what I had read. And then, of course, two or three weeks ago, uh, the president took a decision, and I think it was a brave decision, to release those memos, because it was known what the likely consequences were going to be, although I think the hope was it would close down the debate, and that hasn't happened. But when I read the second memo of the 1st of August 2002, the contents of which I'd been informed about, but when I read in black and white that a lawyer who is now a federal judge on the Ninth Circuit, which I think includes this jurisdiction, would spend time with a professor at Berkeley Law School, supported by the general counsel to the vice president, and supported by a whole little coterie of others, writing out paragraphs in which they examine the various consequences of putting a man alive in a small box with an insect and elaborating on whether or not you could tell the individual who was in the box that the insect did or did not bite, or that the insect may or may not impose a fatal sting, and that the question of whether torture arose depended on a whole series of different permutations of that, you realize that a line had been crossed which really was shocking to read. I'm going to come to the defense of President Obama. I've done a lot of cases that have dealt with issues of international crime over many years. When any society has fallen into the kind of situation in which international crimes have happened, it, it takes time to come to terms with the reality of what has happened. Classical examples is Chile. Let's not forget that Senator Pinochet finally got his day in court 10 years after he left office and 35 years after his worst abuses. I'm not surprised that the issues that are now so dominant have arisen. What does surprise me is that they have come up as quickly as they have come up. President Obama, understandably, I think, and this is maybe a point of disagreement with Bruce, wants to shut down the greater excesses of the debate because I think he realizes rightly that if handled in the wrong way, the resolution of these issues, and they're not going to go away, they're going to have to be sorted out, has the potential to be deeply, deeply divisive at a time when the country faces fundamental threats and challenges. And so he has done a straddling exercise, but he has emerged, and I don't think that it's contradictory, with a position which has said, fine, we're not going to target the actual interrogators from the CIA who relied in good faith on these legal memos. He didn't say there will be no prosecutions. He didn't say there'll be no criminal investigations. He's a man who chooses his words very, very carefully. A Couple of days later, his chief of staff, Rahm Emanuel, said, well, actually what the president meant to do was say, there will be no prosecutions, period. And two days later, President Obama said, no, that's not what I said. <laughs> I was, and I've read every single word very, very, very carefully, and in fact, I, I, after the release statement came with the legal memos on Thursday the 14th of April, just two, three weeks ago, I wrote an op-ed in an English paper, the Guardian newspaper, noting that the president had not said there would be no criminal investigations, there would be no prosecutions. He was very, very careful in his choice uh, of words. And of course, three or four days later, he made clear that he wasn't excluding that and he was opening the door from his perspective to this matter being addressed by the Attorney General. It's a very, very difficult thing for any society to come to terms with criminality and illegality in a predecessor government. Imagine how much more difficult it is when, in this case, we know that it goes right to the very top of the administration. That poses a huge political problem for a democracy. And that's why, in parallel to all of this, the investigation that's taking place in Spain, which has apparently been catalyzed over the past few months by my book, and on which I have some knowledge on the inside of what is happening, has focused on the lawyers. It's focused on the lawyers rather than the people at the top, right at the top, for the understandable and sensible reason that if a foreign judge were to begin to target today, it may be different in three years, or in five years, or in two years, or in 10 years, but if a foreign judge were to begin to target today a former president of this country, a former vice president of this country, 
a former Secretary of Defense of this country, the political backlash would be much, much harder to overcome. So, to cut to the chase, the best prosecutorial strategy is not to focus today on the number one. You do what all prosecutors do. You focus on the number two and on the number three. And once you've ensnared the number two and the number three, particularly if they are lawyers with limited name recognition, without the types of political support that the number one person will have, once you've ensnared that particular group, then you move upwards. And I think these things take time for understandable reasons. I don't think they should be rushed. I do think the president is right to work this through in a deliberative fashion. And I do think he is right to have bifurcated in relation to distinguishing between individuals, whether in the military or the CIA, who did rely in good faith, one assumes in many cases, but not all cases, on these dastardly legal memos written by a group of so-called lawyers. I think that is the right approach to be taking at this particular moment in terms of beginning the healing process, the transparency process, uh, and beginning to come to terms with what has been a very dark period. Thank you very much. So you need to just pull them over like that. Well, thank you both. And, and, and Bruce, I must say that what you zeroed in on is something that, that, that I, it puzzles me all the time. I, I keep looking for the outrage, uh, particularly now with what's happening with the banks and the extent to which the taxpayer is being hosed and, uh, and the people that are, say that they're too big to fail um, won't even open up their books. And, and you'd think that, that <laughs> there'd be populist pitchforks out there marching on Washington. And, and it's, it's also, I think, really uh, true uh, that in Washington, nothing happens unless the people light a fire under these people. The politicians belong to a club that has sort of minor disagreements. Um, so what is this? What's the problem? Is it outrage fatigue? Why are we becoming less of an energetic democracy? There's no simple answer, but I'm completing a book which uh, concludes that we have become a nation that's absorbed the psychology of empire, where um, we no longer care as a people about governing ourselves. As long as the government says, we'll make you safe, we'll try to shield you from economic hardship, then people don't care about transparency. And you talk about the ability still of the system to work. I was in the halls of Congress, many offices, the first day the bailout legislation was voted on in the House of Representatives. There were literally thousands of emails, calls, text messages, faxes saying no. And it was voted down, even though all the pundits said do it. Then it changed. You know, this was like their one last gasp, I guess, of, of uh, popular outrage. Uh, but part of the reason why we've accepted, I think, vassalage to this uh, powerful executive uh, is the absence of civic training, education. People don't know what sacrifices were made uh, in order to give the liberties that we've got at present. There used to be generations that understood that we had to sacrifice so that those yet to be born would inherit something worth inheriting. Now, those yet to be born, well, they don't make campaign contributions. Who cares? Uh, and if you don't know why you are enjoying the liberties you have, you won't fight for them. And say, when we're at a, at, a, at a period of our culture where we celebrate American Idol and some of these idiots who, uh, you know, out of uh, Hollywood or the athletes who have debauched lives, we're the statesmen that are celebrated. It's like they're off the radar screen. Uh, so youths growing up, who do they think is going to be their role model? Uh, people whose actual lives and contribution to freedom is virtually nothing. Uh, and it's reinforced in all the, you know, the, the classrooms, the media, the newspapers, you say, you know, giving attention. I don't know how many times you can be on TV. Well, Britney Spears breaking story. You know, she's stayed in the jail an extra day. 
which is, again, it's an example of how the media even rates the importance of these things. So why would the people growing up in this generation think any of this matters? But I go back again, it is a psychology of empire that is more susceptible to taking hold because the Soviet Union isn't there anymore. We're the superpower, no matter how stupid and ignorant we are, no matter how many lives we sacrifice foolishly in caves in Afghanistan, so what? We're still the, the one country in the world that can uh, march like a colossus without uh, much danger. Can, can I, I, can I, just, I just don't, I just doubt that a psychology of empire such as such a thing exists was the reason there wasn't outrage when information started emerging about abuse and torture. I think it's actually much more prosaic and simple than that. It's that, and I was in New York on September the 11th, and I was painfully aware of what happened uh, on that day. And I was painfully aware that many of my friends who I would have expoke, expected to speak up, my friends, I taught at NYU Law School for many years, my friends at many other law schools, my friends around the country, for two and a half years, a lot of people kept their head below the parapet, people I would have expected to have spoken up. And so I've inquired to myself a lot, why is it that people I would have expected to speak up were not speaking up? And I think the reason for that actually is very simple. What the administration did was engender a climate of fear, and the media took its eye off the ball. I think the media has a very big role to play with what went wrong between September the 12th, 2001, and April the 26th, 2004, when everything changed with the publication of the Abu Ghraib photograph. That was when the dam burst, and some, people realized something had gone wrong. So that was part of the problem. But secondly, popular culture played a hugely important role. You know, when I met with Diane Beaver, spoke with her, and on the third or fourth occasion, she said to me, there was this TV program that we watched down at Guantanamo that actually... I will, I'll speak a little more into the mic. There was this TV program that we watched down at Gu Guantanamo that had a big influence on us. It gave us ideas, it gave us a feeling about what to do. It made us feel we were doing the right thing. She was referring to a program called 24, made over here. It was, it was my book that revealed that that program had had a direct effect down at Guantanamo. So popular culture played an enormously important role in anesthetizing people and actually saying, Torture works. We face a real threat. If, you know, Jack Bauer can do it, why can't we do it? And there was a third element. At the same time as the media taking its eye off the ball, at popular television programs influencing people, well-known legal academics, I'm thinking of Alan Dershowitz, <laughs> was going on national television, speaking in the national media, and saying, Let's have torture warrants. OK, torture's going to happen. So if it's going to happen, let's make it happen transparently. Let's make it happen in ways in which the president signs off on it. And he publishes a book in August 2002 by Yale University Press promoting the idea of torture warrants. And I was told by a clinical psychologist who was down at Guantanamo, a wonderful man by the name of Mike Gellis, that when he would raise down at Guantanamo when this was happening, October, November, December 2002, objections to these new techniques of interrogation that he, as a 20-year interrogator, had said would never work, would be useless. He was met with the answer, look, Mike, you've got people like Alan Dershowitz promoting the idea of torture warrants. Harvard Law School's in favor of this. Jack Bauer's in favor of it. The media isn't telling us that this is a problem. It all conspired. I don't think it's got anything to do with empire. I think it's got a lot more to do with a country that was in a state of shock for very understandable reasons, and which was then presented with a response by its government which said, we're going to make you even more fearful, and if you challenge us and something goes wrong, you will be to blame. And that was the psychology. I think it was pretty simple. But I think the psychology of empire manifests itself in all the ways that you've demonstrated. It's the psychology of empire. We should have no risk. Anything can be subordinated to national security claims. There are no restraints. Uh, and it makes the, the, the public more susceptible to believing that uh, you can say that a mouse uh, is really an elephant with a glandular condition. Um, and that's why the people would accept so readily 
uh, statements that are outlandish on their face. Al Qaeda is a greater threat than the combination of Hitler, Stalin, Hirohito, and Mussolini combined. And they would make these statements that this is, you know, to surrender, this is like at Munich if you don't invade every country in the world. Just utterly hysterical statements, and yet they weren't laughed at because it's a manifestation of empire. We shouldn't have to take any risks whatsoever, and we can use whatever force we want to try to limit whether we have to go 6,000, 8,000 miles away in Afghanistan and use drones that occasionally kill people in wedding parties, so what? Uh, and that has caused people to become, say, that's a psychology indifferent to civil liberties. Read Alexander Hamilton, Federalist Number 8, where he explains exactly the phenomenon you described. Institutions of tyranny then push aside the institutions of liberty in times of war and danger. And when we have not only the previous administration, I think the entire country after 9-11, then subscribed to now by Obama, saying, that we have perpetual war against terrorism, a tactic that you can't extinguish. This is the first time in history we will never be out of a war. There's not going to be Appomattox. There's not going to be a surrender on the USS Tokyo. We are in permanent state of war. And not only that, it has no geographical limits. It's everywhere because you can be a terrorist anywhere. So that you can use military force under our paradigm anywhere in the world. Uh, that shows you how, I think, this empire mentality has taken a grip. Uh, because no other country could possibly make that claim that we would accept for five seconds. Could you imagine another country sending a drone into the United States, say we're trying to kill a Chechen who's a terrorist in Russia? We'd say that's an act of war and we would incinerate. We do it every day, shrug our shoulders, so what? But I do think, uh, Philippe, that you made an excellent point with regard to the victims and why it's more likely that the United States citizenry would go along because they're all Muslims and they've got names no one knows how to pronounce. But it's, this isn't the first time. You remember World War II? Japanese Americans, 120,000 loyal, they're all in concentration camps. People ask, well, how come those Germans didn't go anyplace? Well, hey, they're white Anglo-Saxon Protestants or the Italians. Well, the Italians had some locked up, I guess, in San Francisco. But that's the same silent, if you will, racial or religious bigotry that's at work. Maybe that's the reason why Watergate was a little different, because as John Dean could tell you as well, when you have people like Daniel Shore and famous people you read about in the newspapers on the enemies list, then you get a little bit anxious. No one thinks they're going to be Boumedian or Hamdan or Hamdi or things like that. But that's really quite a, a, a dishonorable characterization of what the United States has become if we don't care about liberties as long as the victim is someone who doesn't share our own skill, skin color or heritage or otherwise. And then we don't need to repeat Reinhold Niebuhr about the Nazis. Where first they came for the trade unionists and the Roman Catholics, and then they came for me, and there was no one to defend me. So, so I, I, I'm with you entirely on, on, the, on the lack of outrage. I'm puzzled about it, uh, but it's, it's, it's clear. Philippe doesn't seem to think that, uh, that that, that Obama's, by compromising as he does, and by not using the power of, of, of outrage, um, that <clears throat> somehow he can navigate Washington. My feeling is that the situation is so dire uh, that somebody's got to become the catalyst for this outrage and, and start leading. I'm not sure that, that, that you know, I. I I'm running out of excuses for Obama over the banking thing. I mean, you know, I don't, I don't want him to, to uh, waste all of his political capital in, in a tantrum. But I do want somebody out there to advance the kind of debate and dialogue that we're having here because there is something terribly wrong but, in uh, a democracy when the people are so supine and so beaten down uh, that they can't uh, rise to their own interests. But, but there is a debate now on these issues. I mean, the reaction over the last four weeks, it's been very late in coming, but what a remarkable four weeks this has been on this issue that we're talking about. I mean, I've followed this very, very closely for six years. You know, every statement, every document, every move. If you had asked me at any point up until three months ago, could I have imagined the President of the United States uttering the words, as for the framers of the legal decisions, 
that's going to be a matter for the Attorney General to decide, and I don't want to prejudge that issue. And opening the door to criminal investigations of the most senior lawyers in the administration, I would have told you that's not going to happen. And it has happened, and it's happened in part. I mean, the, 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 the way in which it happened was a reaction prompted by popular outrage, huge numbers of emails, I'm told, received by congressmen and senators once the legal memos were put out, and extensive outrage the morning after Rahm Emanuel spoke on the ABC program with George Stephanopoulos. The morning after that happened, the president turned up at a breakfast meeting with the King of Jordan, expecting to talk about the Middle East and all sorts of other things, and the only thing the press wanted to talk about was whether Rahm Emanuel was right and whether it was true that there were going to be no investigations and no prosecutions. And that, I'm told, happened because there was an upswell. Now, it's come very late, but it seems to me inevitable there will have to be investigations of some sort in the United States because if it doesn't happen in the United States, it's going to happen in Spain. Britain is already having its own criminal investigation in relation to complicity in the alleged torture of one detainee, Binyam Mohammed. And we now have the remarkable scene in Britain of a criminal investigation being carried out by the Metropolitan Police in London of the intelligence services and possibly of politicians for complicity in torture. So Britain is doing that. It's again been very difficult politically for that to happen. I think it will come in the United States and I think that these things do take time. It's a big thing to get your mind around the idea that your former president is an international criminal. He is, I, a, he is an international Phil, Philip, criminal. I, I just don't get that. Having been a child of Watergate, that we didn't wait. Leon Jaworski wasn't waiting five or six or ten years after Nixon left office. He had to get a pardon because there was an indictment looking at him in the face. This was the president of the United States. Um, and you're saying it's so, we're so brave, go after the lawyers who are GS-13s in Office of Legal Counsel. That seems to me ridiculous. And with regard to stimulating the debate, Obama should be the one who's leading the debate rather than giving cryptic messages through Rahm Emanuel or otherwise. Why isn't he saying this is what we have to confront? Why is he just speaking in these rather coded languages? He's the president of the United States, my God. He has the duty to faithfully execute the laws. I don't have that duty as a citizen. I have a duty to encourage him. He has that constitutional duty. And I don't understand you're making up all of these excuses like, my gosh, the United States never in, in previous history went after the, the highest official then. We sure did. And we drove him out of office. And that was my greatest thrill as an American citizen, seeing that president leave on that helicopter. You know? And we didn't wait 10 years. You know? And we have brave people right in this room, John Dean, who understood that as well. Why are you saying that this is such brave material? I mean, I just nonplussed completely. And with regard to transparency, why isn't Obama making these documents available right now? Why is he waiting for lawsuits to be filed? He should be making them public immediately saying, we are going to have transparency here. Even if Al-Qaeda might know how to brace themselves against future torture so they might not confess to falsehoods, which was, you know, these techniques that were developed were modeled after the Chinese communist treatment of our captives in the Korean War, designed not to get truth but false statements. That shows you how upside down this world was. That's what ought to be happening. I don't understand your total defense of Obama as like it, it, he's it, just leading the, the charge for the Bruce, rule of law. Bruce, it's not a, it's not a total defense. I, there's nothing that you've said that I disagree with. Absolutely nothing at all. But you don't represent the views that sit in Congress. So you and I have both testified in Congress. I testified three times last year. I would have sort of middle-ranking, middle-of-the-road type Republican congressman attack me for the things that I was doing and say to me, look, Mr. Sands, what do you care about this waterboarding thing? Waterboarding was used on three men for a total of one minute each, grand total three minutes. That's Congressman Trent Franks. Okay, what are you wittering on about? A bit of slapping, a bit of that, a bit of the other. It's all a bloody nonsense. Go to sleep. That is the view, not your view, and Obama has got to deal with that. And the reason Obama's got to deal with that is he's got to get people confirmed, as you know, 
in circumstances in which the torture issue has become the bellwether issue. We know that when the Office of Professional Responsibility of the Department of Justice indicated on the 20th of February of this year that it was going to release a report recommended reprimand of the lawyers, all hell broke out because the Republicans, to a man and a woman who had been former attorney generals and former heads of the Office of Legal Counsel, who had said that they would support particular individuals for confirmation, withdrew their support instantly. So there is a political reality. I agree with every word you said in terms of what the president in an ideal world should do. And I think that is what he is going to end but up doing. But these things take time to emerge, and believe, that is the direction I, he is I'm up at Congress two or three or four times a week. And you are wrong in your assessment of what the climate is there. The Democrats in the majority view the president as the messiah. The reason why, and I know the chairman of the House Judiciary Committee would be far more aggressive, except he's getting signals, and I won't disclose, from the White House, don't do it. That's what's going on there. The president could get whatever he wanted out of Congress. Right after he was inaugurated, he could say, pass a resolution saying the world is flat. And they would have done that. Look what he's getting on what he wants, the bailout or whatever. It's almost rubber stamp. And with regard to confirmation of the Senate, Mr. Franks, by the way, is in the House. He doesn't get to vote on Senate confirmations. But putting that aside, the fact is if the president goes forward and defends a candidate, they are not going to jump on a party that's shrinking by the day. Senator Specter is the latest renegade, does not have popular support, can't even win a by-election in, in New York, say well, now we're fearful of our shadow with the Republicans. It is the president who has the power to lead. He's the most popular individual in the United States. He's got 70% approval waiting. What is he wasting it on? You know, we're fearful that he'll get some low-down Tommy Franks who doesn't even know three clauses of the Constitution know to bark. I mean, that's utterly ridiculous. You know, politics is what you make of it. You know, well, take the barometer, somebody might say something that's adverse. Well, so what? He's not president. He doesn't get the votes. He sits in a minority party. Uh, I, I, we're seeing the same people, and we're reading them in completely different ways. You're talking about the chairman of the House Judiciary Committee. Okay, let's talk about the chairman of the House Judiciary Committee. Many of you in this room will know that a criminal investigation is underway in Spain against a group known as the Bush Six. Okay? What has the Obama administration said publicly in relation to a criminal investigation by a foreign judge? Absolutely nothing. Do you remember what happened when uh, Belgium indicated that they were going to start investigating Donald Rumsfeld. Within an hour, President Bush's administration had said, we're going to take NATO out of Belgium if this continues. <laughs> now, there's action, there's inaction, there's silence, there's subtle ways of doing this. The fact that President Obama has said nothing about the criminal investigation by Judge Garzom is hugely significant. I can tell you for fact that Judge Garzon is acutely aware of the signal that that is sending. I can tell you also, if you want to read a press release put out by John Conyers, chairman of the House Judiciary Committee, when word came out of Judge Garzon's investigation, the chairman of the House Judiciary Co Committee put out a press statement saying, this is in essence a welcome development. Since we're not going to investigate, then it is right that others exercising powers under the Torture Convention should investigate. Th these are hugely significant developments. Pause and ask yourself for a moment. Yeah. The reaction of a previous administration, if a foreign judge, some trumped up Spaniard, is investigating the criminality of what the United States of America is doing, it's happening. No one's coming down on it like a ton of bricks. And it's deeply affecting what's happening in this country because people are saying, well, hang on a second. If the Spaniards are going to do it, we ought to be doing it. And that's what's creating the dynamic. And I think you're not recognizing the enormous transformation that is taking place. These are, from my perspective, very, very significant developments. They're not happening by accident. 
They are being led by the administration. True, he's not standing on top of the Empire State Building declaring his desire to see all these people criminally prosecuted, but he's doing a huge, huge number of other things to ensure that a framework is created in which there is accountability, in which there is justice, and in which these men, and they're all men, turns out, one or two women, will never again set foot outside the United States of America because they are at constant fear now of arrest. Read John Bolton in today's Miami Herald. If you want a country view, a contrary view to the view you're expressing, Mr. Bolton has gone on a rampage today in the Miami Herald about the Obama administration's failure to protect these honorable six lawyers <laughs> from the terrible striding efforts of this you know, rampant Spanish judge. That's the world that we live in. And that community of individuals, the Boltons of the world, the Cheneys of the world, a vice president who plainly wants there to be another attack in the United States so that he can turn around and say, I told you so. That is a poisonous, poisonous thing to do. And Obama has to deal with that. Yes, and that is a disgrace that we are outsourcing our system of justice. We're outsourcing our system of justice. We don't take responsibility for enforcing the law against our people. I mean, that's just ludicrous. Absolutely ludicrous. Like we'd have the Spanish investigate Nixon's you know, burglary of uh, <laughs> Albert psychiatrist's office. That, I say, it is utterly absurd. And with regard to what the president had said about the CIA employees, he said, we will defend them and pay their bills, whether they're prosecuted in Milan or Madrid or otherwise. Um, and we have not um, said that we will cooperate and we'll give you our grand jury material if we're so enthusiastic about the prosecutions, because we have the evidence right here. And uh, by the way, let's talk about what kind of investigation is needed. You have a target saying, I authorize torture. Some of them shout it very loud when I was president and vice president. You have the president incumbent and his attorney general saying, waterboarding is torture, a crime. You have the statute that says there are no exceptions for torture. It's a crime. What do you need to investigate? It's an open and above confession. It's like watching Jack Ruby kill Oswald on television. Now, there would be a possible defense. There was a defense, reasonable reliance upon the law, which has been around. But that's a defense you assert. It's not a burden on the government. So what is there to investigate? Why are we waiting around? You don't need an archaeological expedition to go down and get the last element of how many insects they authorized to be in the cage. And that's why I just think you're totally misreading our character as a country. And we did it before. Watergate was our finest hour. People no. quit. They were, author were demanded to do illegal things. We didn't wait around. Well, since, since uh, John Dean's been outed <laughs> here in the audience. Uh, let's, let's get some questions. And I'd, I'd particularly, I, I don't want to impose on you, John, but since we're talking about Watergate, what could possibly be the galvanizing moment? What, what could get us out of this torpor, satisfy Bruce and satisfy uh, Philippe, who's worried that Obama is going to crash and burn prematurely? It's right. Right there. I'd, I'd come as, a, as an observer tonight. <laughs> I know. I, I feel unkind. But, uh, well, Bruce, let me first of all r remind you the sequence of events that occurred with Watergate. The Watergate break-in occurred on June 17th of 1972. Uh, George McGovern, who was Nixon's opponent, and the Democratic standard bearer did everything in his power, suspecting much more than just a bungled burglary at the Democratic headquarters that was going on to raise this issue throughout the 72 campaign. He couldn't get two people in a room to listen to him. There was only one newspaper in the country that was covering the story, the Washington Post, Woodward and Bernstein, two very low-ranking cub police reporters were given their first break to investigate this uh, with the backing of the editor of the paper, Ben Bradley. The New York Times, the nation's paper of record, was ignoring the story. 
Walter Cronkite occasionally would pick up a Washington Post story, but none of the other networks would cover it. So it went on for month after month after month before anybody paid any attention to it. It really isn't until April of 1973 when Haldeman, his chief of staff, Ehrlichman, his top domestic advisor, uh, Dick Kleindienst, his attorney general, and his former White House counsel, yours truly, uh, resigned, that then the media started picking up the story. After that, it became literally a headline almost every other day. Uh, I still have friends in the Washington media who recall those days, and they say, we've just never had it like that <laughs> since, and we hope we never have it like that again, because they still say every time we think about it, we get into withdrawal. So they, uh, they remember the period vividly. But it, then again, it took months and months and months. It took a slow, ponderous, uh, educational Senate Watergate Committee hearing to start alerting Americans to what was going on. The audience initially was very small. Uh, public television carried it, rebroadcast it. Uh, the networks would carry it in pools. People were upset it was interrupting their soap operas, uh, so they didn't like it coming on during the day. So again, it was very slow in evolving and developing. It's really not until we get to October of 73 when uh, Nixon fires the special prosecutor, Archibald Cox, that the public really starts paying attention. They say, uh-huh, this doesn't look good. He's, uh, he has taped himself. He's refusing to turn over those tapes. He's fired the investigator and the prosecutor. And this looks very suspicious. This is where your attention starts to go up. That's about where we are now in a parallel situation while the first set of memos drew attention, the second set has drawn more attention, and it seems to me we're about at the stage where the special prosecutor, Archibald Cox, was released from investigating before Jaworski came in. So again, the process today, notwithstanding faster and much faster news cycles, has been much slower. So these things take time. I happen to agree with Philippe that there is a an educational process going on. I think it's being handled in a way to minimize the blowback uh, to the incumbent, new incumbent who has other things on his platter that he doesn't want to have totally deflected off of his attention. So uh, it, it's, a, it's an educational process. It has not reached the tipping point yet with the American people, but it is getting closer. So I think that the, uh, uh, your point is well made and I think the outrage is there when people get up on the learning curve as to what has happened and how it's happened. There is the outrage, but it is still latent and uh, very much in flux. So stay tuned. <laughs> let's, let's take some um, uh, questions here. Um, th this gentleman down here in front. Wait for wait 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 for the microphone. It'll be it'll be down in a second. No, I can speak. no 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 no. Wait for the microphone. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, the uh, the the question has been put: uh, What is needed to galvanize the American public? And it has also been noted that the Republican Party broke ranks in Watergate. So the real question is. What would it take to cause the Republicans to break ranks at a time when public opinion now is 50-50 for and against torture? And my proposal is that we focus on the thousands of children who have been processed in Iraq, in Afghanistan, 64 of whom were in Guantanamo, some of whom have been raped, others tortured, some have been used as hostages, and many others, we don't know exactly what, uh, what has happened to them, except that um, they have very terrible stories to tell. Uh, on the 1st of April this year, a group outside the New York Times office protested that the New York Times was not covering the abuse of children that had taken place, thousands of children, and they held up this book as the evidence, as 
providing the evidence for that. So that's my proposal. Uh, I'm sure you have some good comments. I, I, I'm not sure whether it will be precisely those facts that you have in mind that will galvanize. And I've listened to what John Dean has said attentively. And I think this is a process that is underway. And it's a very complex process for the reasons I think we all understand. We may be on a slightly different page as to where in the stage we are. But something very important may well be about to be happening. And that is that on or before the 28th of May, the Department of Defense will release thousands of pictures of abuse. The reason that is very significant is that until now, the only pictures of abuse that have been published are photographs at Abu Ghraib. We know that the Department of Defense has pictures of abuse at Guantanamo, at Bagram, and in many other places. We don't know whether those photographs will be released on the 28th of May or whether that'll come in a second or a third cycle. But it's a huge decision because if the photos released on the 28th of May include images of abuse outside of Abu Ghraib, for example, at Guantanamo, for example, in relation to the interrogation of the detainee that I focused on, Mohammed al Qatani, it, it will become impossible anymore to argue that the images at Abu Ghraib were firstly the result of actions of a few bad eggs down there, because we're going to see the same images at other places happening contemporaneously. And secondly, and this work hasn't really fully been done, people will start comparing the precise techniques, for example, in the latest memo that was authorized, and the images. And I'm told by people who've seen the photographs that there will be a very precise correlation. In other words, that critical tipping point being presented with incontrovertible information or evidence that there was a direct consequence between the actions of the administration in identifying techniques of interrogation. Let's not forget where they came from. They are techniques of interrogation used by the Chinese, the Iranians, the Koreans against captured Americans and then reverse engineered for use. That is a shocking fact. That's yeah. the source of it. Once those images emerge, I think that may well be the moment at which people say, whoa, we just now are confronted with something that confirms what a small but growing group have been saying. But I'm with you, John. I think this tipping point issue is vital. I think we're not there yet. And I think we're not there yet also because Watergate was different. It was different from the situation we face now. It was different, firstly, in the sense that Watergate, at least on its face, was directly a crime against Americans and American people. Let's not forget that it's much more difficult for people to get across the board agitated when you are acting in a criminal way against the other, and especially if it is the other that is trying to do us harm. And there are, amongst the detainees who were abused, and it doesn't justify it, people who were seeking to do us great harm, and that infects the reaction that people have. So I think there are a range of very complex factors, and I think we mustn't rush to judgment. I, I also think that it's wrong, and this is a broader political issue, to put the focus at this stage on the current administration for the wrongs of the past. And there is an element of sort of melding things together and saying, oh, they're all much of a muchness. They're all much to blame. They're all in this together. I don't think there is. I think Obama, I won't go over it again, has taken some very, very important decisions. And sitting in London, I can tell you, those decisions have been picked up and they have resonated. And they've done very much to repair the damage that has been done to the image of the United States. And you see that in the images now around the world when he travels, when people in his administration travel, and the restoration of you know, the United States is what I think is rightful place as leading from the front. Uh, I think we're certainly not at October 20th, 
in Watergate phase because there you had a special prosecutor to fire. There isn't anybody there. By the time October 20th came around, John, you know you were on TV. We had had the enormous public education already underway. We had a committee that was already out educating the public. We haven't had any serious hearing on a national security he issue in 10 years. Nothing in Afghanistan. They're all orchestrated. There's nothing serious that's even inquired about. Uh, and as regards the lawlessness, it's true that torture has been directed against uh, largely non-citizens, the enemy, if you will. But for six years, this administration violated the criminal prohibition of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act by targeting American citizens on American soil without warrants. We still don't even know, because, in part because Obama has continued to assert state secrets privilege. Who was yeah. spied on? Why they were spied on? What was done with the information? What is being done with the information? These were flagrant crimes. Obama even voted for the last bill that somewhat retroactively authorized the criminal complicity of the phone companies in the crimes and basically authorized group warrants for the first time in the history of the United States. So what's being done with regard to enforcing that crime? where the victims were American citizens. And the only, these are the kinds of things that were disclosed in the church committee hearings in the 70s where CIA, FBI opening mail, opening telegrams. Here, the, you upgrade it. Now they're looking at emails and telephone calls in real time. And moreover, it isn't just the issue of torture where I think Obama can be faulted for not following his obligation as president. And I'm not trying to insinuate that he has the same culpability of Bush and Cheney. Of course not. I wouldn't suggest that at all. But he still has some. Because he has asserted. He says he will keep people at Guantanamo as, as uh, individuals who are threatening without accusation or charge. He just won't call them enemy combatants anymore. But they're still there. I mean, I have I, amicus curiae brief for the Uyghurs, the 17 Uyghurs. These are Chinese. Muslims in East Turkestan who have been detained for over seven years with no evidence and the government now admits, this is now Obama, that they're being detained illegally. And he says, can't come into the United States because they're illegal aliens. They kidnapped them and they didn't bring their green cards. I mean, this truly is Orwellian. That's, and this is the Obama administration. People thought, well, hey, there's 17 of them. Why don't you let them come into the United States? Oh, the Chinese need to buy our bailout bonds. That's the United States, we're gonna to succumb to that. So there are a whole range of executive power issues that give you cause for concern. His first signing statement uh, had the earmarks of Bush and Cheney on it, worried about whether or not Congress could tell him before he put troops under foreign command, he'd have to take the advice of military leaders. Oh, encroaching on executive power, unitary executive, you're saying, Ian. That's what causes the greatest amount of concern. This is not isolated with regard to the continuation of those kinds of abuses. Well, I, for one, want to be educated as to what it was that was so egregious in that wiretapping regime that uh, Assistant Attorney General Comey and the head of the FBI were prepared to resign, to resign at, at, at Ashcroft's uh, sickbed. So, you know, this stuff has to come out. Yeah. You can imagine how bad it is when John Ashcroft becomes a civil libertarian hero. Yeah? That's, that's pretty scary. And remember, there were the, the wiretap abuses in the Nixon administration that were led to part of the accounts of impeachment. You know, say it's the mentality, I think, that Henry Kissinger displayed after there was a leak of the U.S. secret bombing of Cambodia into the New York Times. There are wiretaps placed on his close aides, Mort Halperin's a friend who ultimately sued and recovered damages. The FBI then examines all of the results of their wiretapping for two years, reports back to Kissinger, nothing other than stories about private lives and girlfriends, whatever. And Kissinger retorts, well, you have to continue it to give them an opportunity to establish a pattern of innocence. <laughs> Establish that's, it. That's all that, that's, that, that's, that's the mentality that goes on with these spy agencies. To a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Let's, uh, look, more uh, questions here from the audience. Uh, on this side, 
This lady in front here in the second row. Uh, thank you, Mr. Fine. I really enjoyed <laughs> your speech, and I almost totally agree with you. The one thing that I think that as concerning the media that nobody has taken into consideration is that the, the federal government has refined its techniques since Watergate. <laughs> uh, several years ago, the Los Angeles Times owned a, a legal publishing company and they sold it and they made about a billion dollars. And their lawyer structured it so that they wouldn't have to pay any taxes. So the IRS challenged them, and they took the entire billion dollars. Now, what kind of message do you think that gave to the media? <laughs> I remember that President Nixon talked about the Washington Post TV licenses being up in jeopardy because they were reporting on Watergate. So. The government has had, you know, leverage on that sense over media for a long time because the newspapers oftentimes own broadcast stations as well since the origination of the sponsors of broadcasters back in the 40s uh, was uh, newspaper investments. Questions on this side? Behind you, on the right there. Thank you. Uh, with all due respect, Mr. Sands, I have to object to the uh, fig leaf that you and the president are giving the CIA. I mean, we've been around a long time and we know the CIA has been involved in torture both directly and indirectly for many, many years. Uh, and I'd refer you to a very nice piece that appeared, I think it was either Sunday or Monday in the op-ed section of the LA Times in which the author uh, set forth this history. I mean. You know, the CIA was involved in Chile and in Guatemala and all throughout uh, Central America and points east and west, you know. And of course, in addition to that, we might just add for the record that the CIA destroyed 92 interrogation tapes. And perhaps when you were talking earlier about how when this stuff comes out, it's going to shock people. Well, apparently what they destroyed was, was beyond hideous. And there is a special prosecutor, John Durham, who McCasey appointed. He's not a special prosecutor. He's just somebody that he pulled out from the department. So that's but he a, doesn't operate with the same And it's not, it's not going to go anywhere. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen. The investigation has yeah. been outstanding for a long time. Sorry, I didn't mean to throw I think, you I think, off. I think that will go. But let, let me respond directly. Let, let me make my position absolutely clear. I, I think that in the light of the experience we have had of hanging out to dry people like Lindy England and Charles Grainer and pointing the finger of responsibility for everything that happened at them, I don't want to see that happen again. Sure, you can take the interrogators from the CIA and you can prosecute them for having used these techniques, but I think you're going against the wrong people. I don't think they are the people, ultimately, who are truly responsible for what happened in a situation of limited resources and wanting to set out the right signals, I think we should go against the people who truly designed the system. And that includes, beyond the lawyers, the individuals who are identified in an intelligence, Senate Intelligence Committee report, which was published two weeks ago by the Attorney General Eric Holder and which provides for the first time a very detailed chronology as to the circumstances in which the two memos of the 1st of August 2002 were written and subsequently used. And listed amongst the participants of the two meetings held, I think, on the 13th and the 17th of July 2002, approving the use of waterboarding, you have the head of the CIA, George Tenet, I'd happily subject him to criminal investigation because it seems to me he has a true degree of responsibility. You have the vice president, you have uh, the then national security advisor Condoleezza Rice and it's her being named in that list, not, not by name actually but just by title so people haven't worked out so easy, that caused what Bruce referred to, the rather entertaining but horrifying uh, short video that you can see on YouTube where she's buttonholed by a group of very bright students 
at Stanford. Who do a be better job than the press. And who basically get out of her that the report in the Intelligence, Senate, Senate Intelligence Committee is wrong because contrary to what it says, it says she was the person who authorized the agency at the CIA to use these techniques. Uh, she was merely, she said, the conveyor of the administration's authorization, inadvertently fingering her boss, who is the person who presumably signed off on it. It was an extraordinary thing to say. But let, let me be clear, it, it's not that I don't say individual interrogators who were in the room perpetrating these techniques do not have responsibility for what happened. It's that I'm saying it's going... But, 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 let's, but, let, but let's be clear, we're at the point of deciding who to go against, okay? What will happen, I can tell you what will happen. If you identify the 12 CIA interrogators who did the waterboarding or who did the other types of... People will then say, oh, well, okay, we got the people who did it, let's hang off, we've had our day in court, let's forget about it. That's absolutely the wrong way to do it. And let me give you a much more personal account of why I wouldn't target those individuals. And I write about it in the book. I met individual interrogators who dealt with the interrogation of Mohammed al Qatani. I met the lawyer down at Guantanamo. I met the head of the interrogations at level of person. We will distract ourselves from those who are truly responsible. And that is why I am absolutely convinced that the people to investigate are the people at the top and the people on tier two and not the people who felt themselves to be under the most extraordinary pressure and threat. And we all have to ask ourselves the question, if we had been Diane Beaver, if we had been the CIA interrogator, and the president of our country tells us to do something, what would we do? Now, it's very easy to say in 2002, well, we wouldn't do it, we would have resigned, we would have done other things. Actually, let's be big enough to ask ourselves the question, what we would actually do in those circumstances. And when, Diane, when I said to Diane Beaver, well, look, you know, you're asked to advise on these techniques of interrogation. Why didn't you rely on the Geneva Conventions? The US military is second to none in its support for the Geneva Conventions. And she just looked at me and she said, Philippe, when I went to the rule book, the pages on Geneva had been ripped out. The president had ordered me not to apply Geneva. What did you want me to do? For me to even have raised the question would have been in subordination. Now, I accept entirely that takes us into Nuremberg territory. Absolutely. Superior orders is not a defense. But every person in this room should put themselves in the position of an individual at that lowly level who is being told by their government that the country is in the imminent and mortal threat where decisions are taken at the highest levels, criminal decisions in my view, but creating a context in which those people act, ask yourself what you would do, and then ask yourself the question, who are the proper people to investigate? And I've come out very clearly in my view on the second question. Yeah. And I hope if I were in Diane Beaver's situation, I would resign. And I would say, I'm not going to do that. Uh, but these are complex, complex issues. Just a quick one, because I've got some questions. I think you've come around to my view that you start out with Bush and Cheney. You started out saying we should go after the low-level lawyers, and now you're echoing me. No, 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 that, um, no, 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 the second, no, 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 no. The, the second observation no, I'd no, make is this. Just, just a short one, and that is, you know, when Hitler took over Germany, they started t saluting their Fuhrer instead of Germany when you entered the armed forces. And we had this chilling statement of Sarah Taylor when she was interrogated by the Oversight Committee investigating the discharge of the nine U.S. attorneys, saying, well, I took an oath to support President Bush. No, I took an oath when I worked in government, like everyone, to support the Constitution of the United States. That's the highest duty you have. And you have to tell the president no sometimes, even if he's the president. 
Because what sovereignty, the first words I read in the Constitution, we the people, doesn't say we the president, we the people are sovereign here. And what's wrong with this kind of attitude is your loyalty is then becomes to a person rather than to the institution, which is the ex explanation for why so much wrong has continued unabated. Now, the gentleman here, two rows back, next to the lady with the green scarf on your right. No, uh, there, <laughs> right in front of you. There you go. Um, uh, Ian, I think that my question was just answered. Uh, and basically, it's this. Are, are we a nation uh, of, of uh, law? Are we a nation uh, of uh, even, I hate to use the word, morality? Uh, are, we, uh, are we a nation of the world? And, um, and are certain people exempt from that and have to give, be given time to uh, think about uh, breaking the law? I think about ordering people uh, to kill. Um, th the whole conversation has a bizarre aspect, Toby. It, it, it's, do, we, do we be able to vote how many people are for um, uh, murdering people in East LA? I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. Yeah. And remember this, even in the military, you are obliged to disobey a clearly illegal order. You're obliged to disobey it. You follow it, you're committing a crime. And if you will put that standard as to what was being authorized here, and you read the memos that were justifying some of this, um, what is conspicuous is that none of them mention that we prosecuted and punished Japanese for waterboarding Americans in World War II. That would seem to be relevant in determining whether it was a crime. Yeah, we should it isn't to even make a cameo appearance in a footnote. We should conscript the citizenry. Uh, <laughs> yes, this lady here. Uh, uh, one, two, three, four rows back. Three in, yes. Oh, we've got people right in the back. Yeah, it's hard to see. Well, I found the uh, dialogue just incredibly interesting, and it's uh, reformulating my ideas as I talk now. Um, there's, uh, Br Bruce talks about having to come up from the people, and I believe that that is what the problem is and where we're going to go. And Philippe, I, bo I agree with that it's going to be a process over time in which that'll happen. And there's an interesting statistic around the process of change that when an idea has 10% acceptance, it has a life of its own. When it gets to 40% acceptance, it is unstoppable. And so I believe where we are now is at least past the 10% and working towards the 40%. So as I listen to you and I, I think, you know, where should we be going and starting, what I really come to feel is that it's even way too early, even though that work has to go on, as to which way we go. Change happens usually in this sort of an environment from many different directions with many people with different points of view all converging towards an end. So it's great that we do this, it's great that we do that. And the final thing I'll say is that the Obama field organization is still pretty much intact. They now have a California headquarters person who's doing her listening tour this very week and next. And I feel a lot more able to verbalize when I go next week why this is one of the things that really needs to be considered in what the Obama people do. Give him hell. Yeah. <laughs> Can I, say, I, I, th I thought that was a, a really hel helpful in intervention because as you were speaking, I was sort of recalling my own journey over five or six years. And I, um, you know, my position has evolved and changed and I'm still not, I still am not clear about what exactly should happen next in the United States. I mean, do we want to have a situation in which we have a special prosecutor or a federal prosecutor appointed to investigate this tomorrow? We know that if that happens, the effect will be everyone will clam up. You won't anymore have documents being released. Photographs will be withheld. And so the point was put to me, is it not better to have a process first in which you have either investigations or unilateral acts by the administration putting out all this material, creating the context. You know, the reality is these are very complex interrelationships. In Britain right now, we've jumped 
straight to a criminal investigation on one particular matter. And the effect of that is the government now says completely reasonably, well, look, it's all sub judice now, so we can't comment on this, we can't put out more stuff, it's been criminally investigated. And remember what happened with Pinochet. Don't forget what happened with Pinochet. I, I have to share with you that the single defining moment in my professional career as a practicing lawyer was on the 25th of November, 1998, when I sat in the House of Lords, our equivalent of the Supreme Court, I was involved in the case, to get the judgment on the question, is Senator Pinochet entitled to immunity from the jurisdiction of the English courts in relation to an alleged international crime he committed whilst he was head of state? There had never been a decision on that issue prior to that particular moment. It had never been decided that a national court could exercise criminal jurisdiction over a former head of state for an international crime. That was just 10 years ago. And the law lords voted by three votes to two, no immunity. And at the moment that the fifth law lord spoke and the third voted against immunity came, there was a sort of audible gasp and an intake of breath. And it was a moment at which the entire axis changed in which the rules of international law and the issues of accountability were transformed. And that was the moment which began the process for the first time, 10 years after he left office, that criminal processes began in Chile against Senator Pinochet. Because it was a society, and this is, I think is your cr crucial point you make, that was so deeply divided on this issue that it was only when the English courts and the Spanish courts began to get involved that a middle consensus emerged in which it ceased to be a sort of left, right, Democrat, Republican type of issue. And Chile said to itself, look, we've got to seize this. We've got to sort this out for ourselves. We're bigger than this. And I think your point is right. The moment when it will begin to happen, and maybe that was the narrative that John was explaining before, is when enough people from the different perspectives come together and say, look, we've got to sort this out. And it may be that we're not quite there yet, and that Obama has recognized that we're not quite there yet. I think we'll get there. I think it will happen. Maybe it'll happen in three months or in six months or in two years. And when it happens, so the US will get it right. Something will be sorted out. It will be addressed, and it will be done well, and it will be done properly. But, but I, I, I just wonder if you know, we are still not quite there yet. Okay, we're running uh, out of time here, but the gentleman on the, on the aisle there next to you. Well, it's been very interesting. I think Mr. Fine is, I mean, there's enough evidence to indict President Bush, um, the authors of the memos, and the CA operatives. And in the course of the ensuing investigation, a lot of this will come out and um, they can decide what other techniques were illegal and whichever, which other members of the administration and members of Congress should be prosecuted or charged at, at different levels of complicity or conspiracy or whatever. So my question is, you know, how, I mean, and, and, the, and the difference between now and Watergate is that most of the people, or at least 50% of the people, are okay, and they don't want to. They don't want to investigate this. So it's going to take an extremely um, strong leader to educate the people. And the question is: is is Obama strong enough to do that? Yeah. And if he wanted to educate the people, he would be the first one hat demanding commission, demanding a Watergate type of inquiry. He's fighting it. If he's trying to educate the people, it's an odd way to do it, trying to suppress the information. And you can walk and chew gum at the same time. In Watergate, we had criminal investigations at the same time John was testifying before the Senate Watergate Committee and the Impeachment Committee. We're having the trial, this, the conspirators and the cover-up. So there's no inconsistency between the two. And with regard to the British system, that isn't the United States of America with the First Amendment. You can have the investigation, the disclosures of information that's uh, available in a public setting at the same time you have a criminal case ongoing. It's not going to dry up all the information. As I say, you can have congressional hearings, you can have independent commission hearings. Uh, and if we're trying to change public opinion, the president should be in the lead. Why is he so mum about it? 
he can command a nationwide platform anytime he wants to to explain why this is wrong, why this is terrible, that the government is the potent and omnipresent teacher and it can't be lawless without inviting every man and woman to be a law unto themselves. He should be saying that, not us on this panel. He has a far more influence. Why isn't he? But Bruce, you, you, your legal argument is, is so clear, uh, but the political ramifications of what you're both saying are so murky because I, I cannot imagine waking up and reading a headline, President Bush indicted, Vice President Cheney indicted, Condoleezza Rice indicted. That is major stuff. I mean, it may, everybody here may want that headline, but that's not going to happen yeah, but, but, but I think that's just because the president is taking the lead. When I came in to Washington, D.C., John as well, a president hadn't been impeached for 100 years. You just mentioned impeachment. It was like you know, changing from the geocentric to the heliocentric theory of the universe. Impeaching a president? I mean, it was just thought unheard of. Executive privilege challenged that unheard of. And yet it happened. It happened because there was leadership. There was Archibald Cox, and there was Elliot Richardson, and then there was Sam Irvin and other people taking the lead and asking these kinds of questions. No, the president says it, it doesn't make it legal. Right, but we didn't know. The drama of Watergate was that we kind of knew he was guilty, but we couldn't prove it. It was John's word against all the president's men, and then Alex came up with the taping, and then the, the dynamics were shifting, and eventually it was proven that the, that the, the president was a crook in spite of his protestations. <laughs> You're, you're saying already we know these guys are crooks. Right. We know that uh, Bush, Cheney, Rice, they're all of them. Uh, so, uh, the, you know, they're, they're already being indicted uh, without the legal follow-up. And it seems to me that that is a big leap between that and getting the public ready to accept the consequences of the f former president, vice president, and national security advisor perhaps, you know, going to jail for... But why, why don't we have a committee that issues a subpoena to Bush and Cheney to come testify? Why not? Ask Cheney, well, what is all the magnificent information you got from this? They should be up there and testifying. But, they but, don't have but, any but immunity. But Bruce, I think, I think it's a sort of butterfly effect. I think this is in train. And I think you, know, you may be right that President Obama has got this all wrong and he should be doing all these other things. But he's done a lot of things. He's decided not to appeal on the release of the legal memos. He's decided not to appeal on the release of the photographs. They know what the consequences of these releases will have. And I think it gets back to this point that the, the lady made there. I, I think what he may be doing is playing the longer game and building up a consensus for what is the right type of action. And I think that there, it, it, you know, it's time will tell whether that is the right strategy or not. Whether you just go big bang right now and we wake up tomorrow morning and see all these guys uh, indicted. And sure, there's a part of us that would feel thrilled about that, but we would know that it would be a strategy that would be absolutely fraught with danger because not everyone shares your view or the views of others in this room. And it would have a divisive effect beyond any we could comprehend, I suspect. And I think the president knows that. And so I'm just, I think this is a pretty smart and savvy individual. If you look at the very first executive order he adopted, it's, it's called, it's entitled Ensuring Lawful Interrogations. Okay, I, I, I'm told that he was personally involved in crafting the wording of it. It's a remarkable document. It basically reinstates the Geneva Conventions, reinstates the Torture Convention, puts those international conventions on a par with domestic federal law, which in this country is a big issue. And then it directs interrogators to have regard to US federal law, the Torture Convention, the Geneva Conventions, when carrying out any interrogation anywhere in the world in any circumstances. And then it's got this wonderful passage, I think it's paragraph 3C of the executive order, and it says, the interrogators in interpreting these domestic laws and international conventions shall take no account of any opinion issued by the Department of Justice between September the 11th, 2001, and January the 20th, 2009. <laughs> now, 
That is interesting, but what it does is it sends a signal. It's a very smart thing to do because it puts the accent on who one assumes he and his administration believe are truly responsible for what happened. And it then creates its own dynamic. And the next stage, of course, is, oh, well, the lawyers will have to be dealt with separately by the attorney general. And I think he's playing a longer game. And I think he's taking incremental steps which are leading things in a particular direction, building up a body of opinion, building up a broad degree of consensus. And inevitably, at some point, the dam will burst, and it will go one way or the other. I think that's what's happening. I think we've got time for one more question. Right next to you there, that gentleman with his hand up. Thank you. Um, Bruce, I think that the reason why uh, President Obama is not being more aggressive is right in front of you. I think he has read your writings and that he, <laughs> he recognizes this empire issue. And to me, that's really what this is all about. And it extends into so many other areas, which is very scary, because the public isn't ready right now because they just want to be taken care of, like you were saying. If the Bush administration talks about you know this fear then public wants to be taken care of, then they're okay, they go about their own business. And now we have this economic crisis and the public just wants to be taken care of. And I would just submit to you that, as an aside, if you look at um, right now, the public doesn't mind if we basically break the law of contracts that has been, as I understand, I'm not a lawyer, but something that's been in place for centuries um, the, with this mortgage situation. And, um, you know, it's, it's just to me very scary the way in many ways this thing is going down and unfolding. And I think the empire thesis is correct. And I think Obama recognizes that right now. Yeah. It is an interesting observation to see how the unlimited executive power has migrated from the national security into the domestic arena for, I think, the reasons you've stated, just like we want no danger from abroad, no economic hardship, we should be able to live a life that's uh, filled with comfort forever, even though it's rather misguided to think the government is smarter than um, private economic uh, guesses as to where their livelihood is. But if you look at the statutes that Obama has sanctioned, they're the most open-ended delegation of authority to the president. The history, they look, Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal look like pikers. Here's a trillion dollars. Just spend it wherever you want. Uh, anything that could re-stimulate the economy, you can do. And in fact, it was <laughs> quite startling to read in the Washington Post an interview with Henry Paulson because the delegations began before Obama came, although he's widened them. This is under Bush and Cheney, in which uh, he was asked what authority did you have to bail out Bear Stearns and give all this loans out uh, prior to AIG? And he said, well, we didn't really have a crumb of authority whatsoever, but I learned in this town if you take a leadership role, everyone will follow you. No, no. <laughs> totally unabashed, saying, of course we didn't have any legal authority. And that's what's happened. You, there's a clause in the Constitution, Article 1, in uh, Section 10, saying that no state can impair the obligation of contract that used to have some teeth in it. Its companion as regards the federal government is the due process clause. But we wipe out contractual obligations all the time these days. Uh, and this is for the convenience of the government to try to make people look like they're the bad guys. But I want to go back to suggest, I think, a more important point that the previous questioner had raised. And it's about Obama thinking that he doesn't want to create disruption or danger politically by doing things that seem too dramatic. And he issues an order saying we're going to shut down any of the torture abuses. And he then disre he, he puts all the, um, the post 9-11 legal memoranda in, in deep freeze. But to me, the greater danger is the institutional practice or precedent that will be set far after Obama leaves office. If he doesn't prosecute these people, then his successors, because Obama will not stay there more than eight years. His successors will say, well, that's what Obama did. But the precedent is, I can do whatever I want, and I will never get punished. 
That is what we need to be worried about. Obama's a transient figure. All of us are. Institutions live forever. Quick last word, because we, we, no, we, I mean, the just fire marshals back, will be evicting us. It sort of so. comes back to, to where we start. I think what President Obama faces is an enormous challenge, because I think essentially his job over the next four or eight years is to manage expectations in a time of decline. I mean, the reality for the United States, and it's a painful reality to come to terms with, and it's essentially an economic reality, I think. I'm grateful for the emphasis being put back to the economic situation. It is that the United States is not going to be able to control, either militarily or economically. And that is not what the people of the United States have been told for the last 20 or 30 years. And I think it has fallen into his lap as a president that he has to basically face up to the job of telling people that. And I think that is a pretty tough thing to tell a country that has had a different set of expectations. Um, well, well the, the British could give them a good uh, Well, I think, I think it's very interesting talking. If you, if you talk, I mean, it, it does follow a certain path. I mean, on the torture issue, Britain's been there. You know, we used the five techniques. It was a very short period. It was from the summer of 1970 to the spring of 1971. It was only used on 18 people. And you will be amazed to know that still today, 38 years on, the circumstances in which that happened and being used still divides people, is still a live issue. On the management of decline, I mean, that is precisely what Britain went through in the 1920s, culminating in 1945 when the United States basically said to the Brits, it's over and you've got to get rid of your empire and you've got to have self-determination and you're going to have to deal with it. Now, we don't know who is yet to come along and say to the Americans, look, it's over, it's different. <laughs> But, but, but it will probably be a financial thing. And it may well be, you know, that it is the Chinese and whose bonds they will, you know, buy and that is having a profound effect on these other policies. And it's not to be sniffed at because the end of the day, the thing that the president has to do more than anything else is restore people's sense of economic well-being and confidence and comfort levels. And it's totally understandable that he would put that above almost everything else at a time of massive instability, massive insecurity, a massive feeling uh, of concern. That has got to be his first uh, priority, and I'm sympathetic to him putting a lot of effort into it. I profoundly disagree with that. You know, when we think about the greatness of Athens, we don't ask what their GNP was, how, what their unemployment rate was, how many cars or how many oxen they had in their garages or whatever. The most important thing is what we are as a people. You know, when we think about the founding generation, the protests against the stamp tax, you know, the Boston Tea Party, we talk about, well, how much unemployment there was or what was the impact on the economy? No. You know, what characterizes civilization is the values we have, the respect for the rule of law, irrespective of whether it means that we have a booming economy or otherwise. When the priority is, hey, just how, many, how much money do we have? That's the key. Are we at work? Not who we are as a people, whether we respect learning and tolerance and honoring the rule of law. Then we've lost it. No, that's not the United States it's, of America. It's not it either or. It's, it's not either or, Bruce. It's and not either or. It's not. No, but I mean, that's I'm what you saying, said was number no, no, one. No, no. That was I, what you said was number one, Philip. No, and that, that no, other no, things Bruce, should Bruce, take a subordinate Bruce, status. It's the same in the United States as in Britain. People feel incredibly vulnerable right now. They feel inc no. yes, they. A lot of a lot of people feel very, very vulnerable. It's a dangerous world. It's a world in which there are, we are told, bad people out there seeking to do us harm. Our economic foundations are being cast asunder. And it's a pretty challenging moment for any leader, whether it's Britain or France or Italy or China or the United States, whatever, to deal with that reality. It's not either or. Of course we keep our eye on who we are. But when there has been a degree of imperial overstretch, when you can't catch Osama bin Laden, 
when you can't sort out Afghanistan, when you can't sort out Iraq, when your economy appears to be crumbling, when foreclosures are at record levels and unemployment is going up, that is a time when people feel pretty vulnerable. And you can't just say, well, I don't believe that that's important for the president to deal with all of that. Of course the president's got to deal with that issue because on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, we have, I feel that sense of vulnerability. People around me feel that sense of vulnerability. It, it, it is coming to terms with sorting that out and that's a pretty tough thing to do. Well, what's a really tough thing to do is to end this because <laughs> uh, this is so rich, but we have to. I thank both of you gentlemen for coming here to the Forum into Los Angeles. And do come on uh, the 26th of this month. We have one of our guests has just spent uh, the last few days briefing the Vice President in advance of the meeting with Kazai and uh, uh, the bag man, whatever his name is. <laughs> um, so uh, it, it, we, we should be getting uh, some... Zadari. Zadari, right. <laughs> Mr. 10%. Um, so we should have some really interesting insight into that uh, subject, which is an another meaty one. It, it is Afghanistan, Obama's Vietnam, question mark. So do come.